Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics, three film geeks discussing movies, both new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. This week we tackle the latest Bible-related film, Darren Aronofsky's Noah, and Jason Bateman's directorial debut, Bad Words. Our triple feature of older movies includes new classic 21 Jump Street and our first official listener's choice for old classic, In Bruges. Our top ten this week, inspired by Jason Bateman, is our favorite directorial debuts of the 21st century. Before we start, though, there is a news item to talk about regarding our first film. Noah was released in over 30 countries in a 3D version, but Paramount decided against releasing it in 3D in the U.S., the U.K., and other territories. So I wanted to see what you guys uh, made of this. Justin, let's hear from you first. Personally, I think it speaks to a lot of... uh, with. The United States having significantly lower 3D scores, I mean 3D takings for uh, movies in that regard. I know it's gone down significantly, and it's interesting that what most people saw as like the next big movement in cinema is sort of going the opposite direction now. I'm wondering if it's ever going to resurface, because I still think there's a lot, a lot of cool stuff that can be done with 3D, but it needs to be in the right hands. Instead, we're getting these movies that are done post-conversions that are just mediocre and thrown together at the last second for the sake of making a quick buck and they just aren't worth it and we need movies that fit the bill more and it really saddens me that Noah had to suffer because of that do you think Noah is suffering because of it well I think when we were watching Noah I, I kept wondering what would this have been like had we seen it in 3D I, I keep wondering if it would have given that kind of atmosphere that really good 3D does like with Gravity, we were drawn further into the story. With Avatar, we're drawn further into the story. But then we have other things, like I said, that are done post convert and they are unwatchable mockeries. Well, and that's how Noah was. I mean, it wasn't shot in 3D. All of the good 3D we've seen are movies that have been shot in 3D. Okay, so This no- would have been a post-conversion, and that's how they did it for the other territories. I, I think it speaks more to Paramount's decision to get the best bang for their buck Mm. because when you release a movie simultaneously in 2D and 3D a lot of times theaters will half the times so half of them can be in 2D and half of them can be in 3D and if they're getting diminishing returns on 3D tickets they may as well just make it all 2D and get the biggest bang for their buck whereas in some of these other countries the 3D boom is still alive and and thriving you know you, you said that It wasn't really the next big thing, and that's true for America and the UK and some other territories, but in places like China, Russia, I mean, 3D is, like, the top, and apparently there's a lot of theaters that only show 3D movies over there. Oh, wow. Um, Joe, what do you think of the whole thing? Well, I think if it wasn't shot in 3D, it was just a good move on their part. I think it could have benefited from some cool 3D shots, but I don't think it's really suffering without it. I thought it was pretty visually striking on its own. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I don't think it's going to suffer much for it, you know. And as like I said, post conversion stuff is typically kind of bad anyway, so I find it more distracting than helpful. Really. Yeah. So I, it doesn't really bother me actually. I think it's probably a good move on their part. Uh, yeah, I thought the same thing. I thought. I mean, I certainly won't miss the three D. The last post converted that I saw that was any good, yeah, it was probably uh, GI Joe or I mean something a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Everything we've seen good recently has been shot in three D. And I think people are sort of looking into it a little bit more before they buy their ticket. (laughs) Because we saw the take of 3D in Gravity, and the take of 300 Rise of an Empire actually wasn't too bad either. Mm. But then every other 3D movie this year, you know, be it Frankenstein or Hercules, I mean, granted, they bombed anyway, Mm -hmm. but the 3D take specifically was an even smaller percentage of what they like to see. Were those post-conversions as well? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think 300 might be the only real 3D so far this year, which might explain... Makes sense. ...why I had a a little bit of a bigger uh, percentage. All right, well, speaking of Noah, let's uh, get to that in our first review, and Justin's going to have that. In this artistic reimagining, Noah, played by Russell Crowe, has recently experienced horrific, apocalyptic visions of life as he and his family know it coming to an end. As they begin their journey, they encounter and later recruit Watchers, angels being punished for failing to save Adam and Eve from corruption, and aiding them to build an ark so that life can begin anew from the vicious descendants of Cain and their leader, played by Ray Winston. 
I want to begin my review by placing a large emphasis on the fact that this is an artistic reimagining of the biblical story, because that will dictate how much one will appreciate this film. Director Darren Aronofsky, perhaps one of the best filmmakers in the business, has put together a great film, but needless to say, some of the new details that he's decided to put in to make up for the relatively short Bible story will likely ruffle the feathers of devout Christians. While what he puts together is interesting and intriguing and relatively well put together, it does take a little bit of time coming to terms with it. The editing in this film is truly spectacular, particularly with the symbolism and going into the deeper themes such as such as including the controversial theory of evolutionary creationism into the story. However, this can become a bit much for some with some of the rapid cuts that I think might prompt a seizure. Admittedly, the film does lose a bit of steam near the start of the third act, but quickly compensates to offer up a good finale without being overly preachy. No pun intended. Hmm. Overall, Noah gets a great epic treatment that's well worth a watch for the look alone, and I give it a B+. Hmm. Well, of the three recent religious stories, we had uh, Son of God, God's Not Dead on last week's show, Noah was always destined to be the best of them, thanks to having Aronofsky at the helm. The one thing you can always count on from Darren is whatever you're watching will be original and visually appealing. Noah is both of these things, of course, though that isn't always a good thing for it. It's too long, for one thing, especially because, like Justin mentioned, the story in Genesis is so short it didn't need to be a two plus hour epic but for another its originality flies in the face of the biblical version of the story which justin also sort of mentioned it's a definitely a artistic interpretation and not all of that worked for me either plus some of the visuals didn't always work for me either like all the time-lapsed video portions that's sort of i think where you were going with the seizure infused parts i uh, didn't, didn't love those um, that being said, it's Russell Crowe's best leading performance in about a decade. <laughs> Jennifer Connelly and Emma Watson are great as well, of course, and visually, it really is pretty striking, as you'd expect, for Aronofsky's big-budget debut. It's nice to get a movie like this that audiences can talk about the moral values of the various characters, but there isn't enough here to keep me from giving it much more than a borderline positive, so it's a B-minus for me. Joe? The Tale of Noah is one of the best-known pieces of the Old Testament and a foundation of several major religions. The task of bringing this story to the big screen while keeping it entertaining, intriguing, and respectful would be a massive undertaking. Darren Aronofsky is one of my favorite directors. His films have such a mystical tone built upon heavy atmosphere through meticulous editing, amazing cinematography, and minimalistic but powerful soundtracks. He also seems to be able to get very believable and memorable performances from his actors. Noah has many of the trademarks I listed, getting good performances from all the leads. Russell Crowe gives one of the better performances in some time, as Dan pointed out, and Jennifer Connelly and Anthony Hopkins do well, as, as expected. Emma Watson and some of the other cast members aren't quite as good, but they still do well enough. As expected, the visuals and sound are fantastic. Also, the basic story, which does follow the source fairly well, isn't that hard to mess up. However, it is in the expanded details of the narrative where some discussion can be had, as both of my colleagues here mentioned. The script is attempting to tell this fantastical tale in a way that brings certain believability and humanity to these characters, despite the honestly rather dark nature of the story. Some viewers may have a problem with this, but in a way it is staying true to the original biblical tale. Sadly, this gives the film an underlying unpleasantness which is often prevalent in the director's other works. I'm not sure if it worked as much here, partially because if there is a message here, I'm not entirely sure it's clear. Still, it did bring some freshness to the ideas of the tale. The biggest negative here is the pacing. Understandably, this film is recanting an epic, but somewhere around the final act, as Justin pointed out, the movie feels like it's a bit stretched out. Also, the antagonist of the film was rather underdeveloped and overstayed as welcome. Despite some issues with the central themes and a few underdeveloped ideas, it's a film that's certainly worth watching. I give it a B- minus as well. Hmm. Yeah, I think we all sort of felt the length on that. A little bit. Not as much as you guys, honestly. I, I thought I was going into it, and while we were watching it, I mean, up until that point around Act 3, honestly didn't bother me that much. I was enjoying it. I honestly didn't notice it until that point. But then, I guess that point was still an extra 45 minutes. And I felt like it could have wrapped up. Because honestly, in that point in the story, it's pretty much just Noah sends out the dove and waits. And then they're saved. And they wanted to add more to that. Obviously, to give the characters a bit more tension. Mm -hmm. What was going on with the family there. Which was good. And I did like it. But I did feel like that it, it went on a bit too long after that point. If it had 
cut off a little bit shorter if they had taken out a few little things i think i would have given it a higher grade but it was just a bit too long for me yeah that was definitely one of my problems with it i did like emma watson though you didn't think she was anything to write home about i thought she was fine i just didn't think she was as good as some of the a-listers and I, w- okay. and I would agree with that i mean she was she was good she was memorable but i mean just as, as i said she was good she just wasn't quite as good as they were okay but yeah she was fine i actually liked her more as the story went on yeah. As her character sort of got more and more um, frazzled about uh, you know, Noah's plans for yeah, mm-hmm. her issues. Yeah, it's definitely the most uh, interesting interpretation of Noah I've ever seen, being a very tragic, tortured individual. Yeah, which is, I mean, sort of Aronofsky's <laughs> trademark. Yeah, pretty much all his, his characters. All his main characters are kind of like that yeah. from day one. But no, he, he does that well. And I, I agree with you guys. I think Russell Crowe did a good job. Yeah, it's really good to see him finally, like, Not breaking suck. out. Well, like, <laughs> Man of Steel last year, he had, you know, a minor role in, but he mm-hmm. was good in that. And then this, everything else I've seen him in, and we've talked about this when we uh, talked about Pompeii. Yeah. That I've never seen Gladiator. But I have seen, like, Beautiful Mind. Love that movie. Mm-hmm. That was probably the last thing I saw him in that I was like, okay, great actor. I mean, Les Mis, he was easily the worst part of. Yeah. You know, Broken City that came out last year was terrible. Um, so it, it's good to see that he's maybe... Getting it's, back in well, the Well, maybe stride. it's the projects that are terrible, and he well, is... to be fair... Still got it. I think Russell Crowe is a talented actor, but I think it often... It often, I think he's one of those guys that relies a lot on the director. And mm-hmm. if the director's really good at getting where his actor's strengths are, then he can excel. Because I think, like with Ridley Scott and Gladiator, he gave arguably his best performance there because he was working with a great director. So right. I think that might have something to do with it. It makes sense. But Aronofsky I, is a great director. You know, he is. And I feel like, uh, as we've talked about this before, but I feel like he really was at his peak in like the late 90s, early 2000s. And yeah. then it seems like about the last decade it's been hit or miss. M- mediocre at best, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was actually should have brought this up in my review earlier, but that is worth a point. He's one of my favorite directors, and I love all of his movies. Of all the ones I've seen, this one was my least favorite, personally. Yeah, I, I haven't seen quite the filmography like you guys have. I think this is either my third or fourth Aronofsky, and it would be my least favorite for sure, yeah. I will give him this, though. He's not one of these directors that cranks out a movie every year or two movies a year. I mean, he really takes, takes time. his time, mm-hmm. picks the projects that he's passionate about. And, you know, for an atheist to do a biblical epic... Mm. I think says probably more about his character yeah. than it does about anything else, even. From what little I know about the guy, he is a, a pretty awesome person. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I'm, I'm actually glad you made that point, Dan. Um, while uh, in the production phase of this, uh, Aronofsky was quoted as saying he wanted to make the least biblical movie of all time. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I was wondering if you guys thought this, this one fit the bill or not. They did try to kind of, oddly enough, keep the the concept of God as a certainty out of the movie. Like, there's like an underlying factor there. I, I think he was trying to, he was trying to be respectful, but kind of show both sides a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they ever once called him God. The creator. They call, yeah, they, I was going to say. They call him the creator. Which is a more universal idea. Yeah, it's more broad, certainly. Um, which I kind of liked, but, honestly. No, I, I did too. I mean, at the same time, an atheist wouldn't even believe in that so well you know it's kind of funny you bring that up uh actually the fountain which uh, i think is really personally i think is one of his better works is actually a kind of oddly enough a very spiritual movie hmm. so I, I don't know it, well it's very interesting then he I, he might be an atheist but i guess that means he might not necessarily have a lack of spirituality i, I don't really know the issues there but uh yeah that, that that's an interesting point hmm. he definitely knows the pulse of things for sure well, and I, I think he's certainly not a director that's afraid to go into maybe something he's uncomfortable with mm-hmm. or, you know, that might be a little more difficult for him to properly get a message across. I mean, he seems like he kind of takes things head on and is original enough mm-hmm. that he's, you know, not well, afraid of the challenge. You can tell from the editing alone with Noah and just the cinematography that he was still trying to really sell the tone of this movie and the message and just get you sucked into the world. Yeah. So if he's doing that much well, he has some respect for it, and he, he was taking it on full head. I think he put a lot of good effort into this one. Yeah. 
Well, up next is Bad Words, and this is Jason Bateman's directorial feature debut, uh, like I mentioned at the top of the show. In it, the actor plays Guy Trilby, a 40-year-old man who, through loopholes in the rules, starts competing in children's spelling bees. And since he's within the rules, as hated as he is by the other contestants' parents and the bee officials, he is allowed to compete, and he wins his way all the way up to the national championship, where most of Bad Words takes place. All the while, an internet reporter who's sponsoring him, played by Katherine Hahn, is trying to get information as to his reason for doing this, while she also keeps backsliding into bed with Guy and hating herself in the morning. Guy's reasoning for participating in the Bee becomes obvious about halfway through the film, but doesn't really detract from the fun. What does detract is that sometimes Guy is too mean, and unnecessarily so, Mm -hmm. and it especially doesn't even make sense when the big reveal hits. I'm not sure if some of that is because it's not really in Bateman's wheelhouse to play the mean card, but either way, some of it just wasn't funny. Joe, you kind of felt the same on that? I'm actually glad you pointed that out because I I really felt like it was funny, and I'm just, I'm not, I'm used to Jason Bateman, like, kind of like he's in Arrested Development, where he's sort of like the one nice guy in the middle of things. So seeing him play the bad guy, I liked it, but I do agree with you. Like, sometimes I'm like, he's he's just being too mean to these people. Like, he would, you know, like, 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 sabotage specific children in the spelling bee. But it's like, at the same time, he's spelling the hardest words they can throw at him. Mm-hmm. He can win on his own merits. He can be a jerk to the B officials yeah. and maybe the kid's parents. But why why a jerk even, to the kids. Yeah, why be a jerk to the kids specifically like, when you can clearly beat them? Especially the one scene uh, with the ketchup. That's exactly what I was thinking. That was like, okay, that was just wrong. It was Yeah, and I, I didn't find those parts of the movie funny, and that definitely uh, detracted to it. But his directing is very sharp and focused. He's been in the comedy business for over 30 years and has directed television shows before, so it's no surprise that he has a clear vision of how his comedy should look. And no review of this film would be complete without talking about the real star of Bad Words, Rohan Chand. The pint-sized actor had bit roles in Jack and Jill and Lone Survivor, but makes his star here as Chaitanya Chopra, one of Guy's fiercest competitors, who wants nothing more than a new friend, and realizes Guy might need one, too. He is more adorable than Jackson Nickel, the standout from last year's Bad Grandpa, and without him, Bad Words has no soul whatsoever, and that would be a problem. I just wish the movie was as funny as Chand is cute. Bad Words gets a B. Joe, since you've already uh, spoken up, let's hear more from you about Bad Words. All right. Jason Bateman knows comedic timing. For his first film, Bateman works well with a narrative keenly mirrored on his own form of humor, though with a little more jerky edge than usual. The core of this story is driven by often hilarious dialogue and Bateman's delivery, as well as his chemistry with Rohan Chand, one of the better child actors I've seen in a while. Surprisingly, the motivations for Guy's stun are actually kind of understandable, and there is some real suspense in finding out how the situation will be resolved, leading to a decent conclusion. I'm not entirely sure if Guy is a likable character, but he's an entertaining one. The only major issue with Bad Words that I have is that there is some wasted potential with some of the side characters, such as Catherine Hahn's journalist character and Alice and Jenny's spelling bee director. I loved her. Well, I always loved her. Yeah, we we love Alice and Jenny and anything. West Wing, man, always. Still, the main plot of the film was solid enough, and the humor was mostly dead on for me with a few exceptions, and I give it a B. Yeah, when the nastiness really worked was when it was with the kid. Mm -hmm. Because all these other kids that he's mean to, it's like they're not really doing anything to him. But this kid is, like, you know, trying to be his friend and, you know, kind of being a little bit of a nuisance in his eyes. Mm -hmm. So, like, that stuff I thought was the best of his meanness. Yeah, definitely. You know? Justin, what did you think of Bad Words? Similar to last year's Don John, which was the directorial debut of Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Jason Bateman's attempt at directing is spirited, but decidedly has room to improve. In the case of Bad Words, this comes from that of the overall narrative. While comedy is often known for encouraging suspension of disbelief, there's a certain technique in adequately using it, so it's mostly effective. This works during the hilarious moments with Newcomer, as both my colleagues have mentioned Chant, as his rival speller Chopra, but there are far too many instances during the actual competition itself, where it's still funny, but it's kind of hard to believe. The narrative itself, involving Bateman's character Thrillby, is interesting, but more often than most, feels predictable. Bad Words is still an entertaining film to watch, particularly amidst the onslaught of misfires, 2014 as shoved in front of audiences' faces, but just needs a bit more of a push for Bateman to find his niche behind the director's chair, and I give it a B. 
not even 2014. I didn't think there was a whole lot to write home about last year either. I mean, the the two like big broad comedies we had were Identity Thief, also starring Bateman, of course, and The Heat, both of which I gave lesser grades than this. I I don't think we've had a really good fall down. F- well, I guess this is the end. Yeah, I stand corrected. This is the mm-hmm. end. Was I mean, it wasn't as big of a hit as those other two, but it did very well. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I guess I concede to that. But yeah, certainly it's it's the best comedy we've had since then. I would second that. And yeah, we're used to seeing Bateman as like this sort of downtrodden, you know, between Arrested Development, Identity Thief, mm-hmm. um, Horrible Bosses, <laughs> you know, uh, sort of um, the role that Ben Stiller uses mm-hmm. to to perfection as well in, in many of his movies. So I don't know. It was it was a little bit maybe out of place to see him in this venue, like be this mean. Well, I thought he executed it pretty well for the most part. It's just that like some of the comedy that he was going for was a little mean. But I yeah. still think he, he, he did it well. He performed oh, he, it well. Yeah, I mean, his, his comedy always has sort of a... Bite? Yeah, like a bite to it. I mean, like, in Arrested, yeah, he was the downtrodden brother, but at the same time, he was, you know, the sharpest one with the the comeback, you know? Yeah. So in terms of that, yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the the biting nature of of some of the stuff. Um, How did you guys feel about the the resolution of everything? Joe, you sort of mentioned that Uh, it was was pretty satisfying. I thought it uh, it was decent, but I just... I wish there could have been a little more expanded because I felt that the way he approached it, I, I we're, we're meant to feel a certain way about certain character, mm-hmm. but I actually was kind of on that character side. I felt like we didn't know the whole story about why he did what he did, right? And there was a bit of a hint there that okay, maybe he's not a completely bad person. I mean, obviously with the you know organization he set up, right? He's got to have some good things about him. So I didn't feel like I felt like it was a little bit unfair, honestly. That we could have expanded on it, maybe had a little more of a resolution there expanded upon truth be told the way the film wrapped up didn't bother me it was i don't want to call it safe it was just sort of like okay if that's how you're gonna wrap it up i'll take it pretty standard yeah i I think standard is a good choice word and the the whole katherine hond character i do agree joe with you I, i wish i don't even know if i wish she was expanded more i wish she was a little bit different I don't really love the sleeping with him every night. I don't know. You know, um, it seemed like... Well, I felt like if they were going to go that route, they should have finished up that little bit of her character. It was funny the first time, but after, like, the second and yeah. third time... Yeah, I think maybe it, once like, would have been fine. You're right. Yeah, but the, if they're going to continue with it, they better go somewhere with it. Right. Yeah, you know. Yeah. That's kind of how I felt about all other aspects of it. Like, a lot of the side characters. Like I said, she mm-hmm. was the most prominent one. It is interesting to note Jason Bateman... Another great guy, you know. You always hear how nice he is and everything. The guy uh, that was reading the words at the National Bee, I know that guy. He played Bateman's best friend in one of his early sitcoms from the '80s called The Hogan Family. Oh wow! You don't really see him, you know, pop up anymore. I knew the face, but um, but he's very funny. <laughs> he was, and, and I thought it was cool that you know, just sort of as a nod to you know, hey, we've been friends for thirty years in the in the biz. Let's give you a role here. I thought he was really funny in it, too. He was. Yeah. All right, well, moving on, we've got Enemy, and Joe's going to tell us about that. Enemy is an erotic thriller from the director of Prisoners and stars Jake Gyllenhaal. It is based on the 2002 novel The Double. It follows a man named Adam Bell, an assistant professor of history who leads a rather dull and repetitive lifestyle, primarily spruced up by sexual escapades with his girlfriend. This changes when he discovers that he is an exact lookalike, a man named Anthony St. Clair, an upbeat small-time actor with a pregnant wife. After Adam seeks out Anthony, Anthony becomes threatened and becomes overcome by paranoia and rage, believing that Adam has slept with his wife. This leads to Anthony stalking Adam and forcing him to take on his identity in order to sleep with Adam's girlfriend. This is a strange and rather dark film with lots of layered metaphors, thematic undertones, and some erotic symbolism. Taking into account a rather unique, if slightly ambiguous, premise, it is executed rather well with tight direction, beautiful cinematography and sound design, and a powerful performance from Gyllenhaal. When viewing the film, I would recommend paying close attention to detail and looking at the film in two ways. View it as a thriller of sorts, but also as a metaphorical commentary on a number of human elements. While I very much enjoy this film, I can see that it certainly isn't for the casual viewer, and it does seem to have a slight lack of focus, since it seems to want to say a great deal, but perhaps too much for 90 minutes, which leads to a rushed, though thought-provoking ending. 
It might not be perfect, but there is a shade of brilliance here, and I give it a B plus. Hmm. All right. Without trying to give too much away to you, Joe, before you had seen it, I described my frustration with anime by describing it as lostish, referring to that show's uh, legend for posing more questions than it answers and its unsatisfying conclusion. Enemy for me, though, very well acted, like you said, by Gyllenhaal and also Melanie Laurent, and with some interesting directing choices that work, poises itself for failure after the first hour. Once it gets so deep into the story so that the audience doesn't know what's going on any more than the characters do, I sort of felt like there was no possible conclusion that would be satisfying that I could think of. So unless they had something truly genius up their sleeve, it was not going to end successfully. I'll give them this. It definitely wasn't something I thought of, but it also was not satisfying. I've always felt that if your entire movie hinges on one resolution and it's unappealing, it sort of negates the entire point of the movie. It's an interesting thing you said, though, Joe, about viewing it two different ways. And now that I know the conclusion of it, Mm. I certainly wouldn't mind seeing it again and trying to pick up on some clues. Mm Mm-hmm. As you guys know, I don't like to read reviews or have things explained to me about a movie before we record the show because I believe the movie should speak for itself. I'm not an idiot. If I can't figure out what's going on in a movie, maybe it's just not done that well. But I admit I decided to seek out an article explaining what actually happens in Enemy after I saw it. While it's still unsatisfying to me, I at least understand now what they were going for after reading the article. That plus, we actually pushed this one from last week's already long show, which gave me even more time to think about the execution of the film. So between those two things, I definitely give it higher than I was going to and end it on a C. Hmm. Justin? What I find myself noticing about the two films I have seen from director Denny Villeneuve is that his movies are complicated and need time to reflect on them. Granted, Enemy's a bit more explicitly surreal than his dark mystery from last year, Prisoners, but it's nonetheless thought-provoking and as such likely to divide audiences. Joan Holds does a great job of going between roles and making his audience wonder the motives of both characters and if the audience is only scratching the surface of either one. The result is a style that reflects the master of suspense himself, Hitchcock, and that of surrealist filmmaker, David Lynch. And while it starts off as odd, the two tend to complement each other as the film goes on. It does take a little bit of time to get moving, and the symbolism, as Dan mentioned, is not always easy to understand, but it never ceases to keep one interested well after the film is over. Enemy's not going to be for everyone, that much is certain, but I have to say it's one of the most unique and interesting films we've seen thus far in 2014, and I give it a B-. minus. Yeah, it was funny, I kept like sort of ra- inching my grade like higher. Like last week when we were, were going to do it for that show, I was I had it at a C minus, and then like Justin mentioned, it does kind of stick with you, you know. And so while I was thinking about everything for this week's show, I just sort of thought, you know, it probably does even deserve a little higher than that. I think it's supposed to be a film that's supposed to get you thinking, mm-hmm. and I think if it does that, it did something right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once once the credits start rolling. Joe and I in the theater, we probably spent a good like two minutes watching the credits before we yeah. said a word to each other. Would, I would just think we were both thinking of what to say, and we just we just like how to sum that up. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was funny. We we saw the whole film, I guess, because of that. We just sat there waiting. <laughs> just like, hmm. were you guys both satisfied with how it concluded? Uh the more I thought about it, it actually worked for me. That immediate when when it cut actually to the end, I thought it was a bit sudden, mm-hmm. but I think that was done intentionally. Initially, I could definitely understand where you're coming from, but uh, I actually enjoyed it a lot more, I think, upon upon reflection. reflection Though, yeah. I do agree it probably could be improved on a little bit. Actually, uh, I told Justin this. I don't know how you felt about it, Dan. I thought the ending was very disturbing. It, well, it was. It was, it was extremely disturbing. It was, like, it was like, it made me jump a little bit. Mm-hmm. When I originally saw the ending, I was not, I don't want to say satisfied, but more or less taken aback. Okay. But as the credits are rolling, like, like Joe mentioned... We were trying to figure out what to say to each other, and I, I just was thinking, like, okay, what does that exactly mean? <laughs> what what am I missing here? And mm-hmm. and even while I was driving back home, I, I kept thinking about it and kept, it kept drawing my intrigue, and it, it definitely helps. I think it's one of those that you really need to watch, think about, possibly watch again, and then and then decide on what a grade is. I, I could definitely see this uh, jumping up on a, on a rewatch. Yeah, same, t- same here. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe I did seek out that article because I saw it by myself. So at the end of it, and you guys hadn't seen it yet at all, so I couldn't talk to you about it. 
So I just I was wondering, like, okay, am I missing the the bottom line? Like, what what was this movie really about? Like Joe mentioned with all the different metaphors, you know. And obviously, the article I read was one person's opinion of what they interpreted from the film, mm-hmm. but it made a lot of sense to me, mm-hmm. you know, and and sort of got me thinking about things in a, in a slightly different manner about what it meant. I still think that it asks way more questions than it answers but i guess that's the point yeah i think i like i like i said i think it's supposed to ask you those questions to get you thinking about them but i don't think it's supposed to provide any exact answers Mm -hmm. to be honest though i do think that the like metaphorically speaking i think a a lot of the symbolism worked for that it's actually the main plot i kind of feel like could have gotten a little bit more of a clear resolution mm-hmm. perhaps i yeah i completely agree with because that. i'm like hmm, i wonder it actually made me want to read the book because i'd imagine that hmm. the book it might be a little more straightforward yeah possibly i could see that so i'm like maybe i'll read the book to find out maybe exactly what happened because i felt like maybe they cut out maybe a, a few chapters or at the end or something mm-hmm. i'm not sure not to go too far off topic but do you guys think that at some point Hall is gonna get an oscar he should. Every movie he's in, it's like, is better than the last. Brokeback was the first time, the first movie I saw of his that I was like, okay, this dude is like the real deal. And then, you know, so many movies since, and he's always good. Yeah. He was great in Prisoners. Yeah. He's great here. End of Watch. Uh, end oh, of Watch? Yes. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, yeah I agree. I, he's actually one of those people I didn't really typically think about, but you're right. Every movie that I can remember seeing him, and I have liked him a lot. Mm-hmm. He's, he's a very good performer. He keeps getting better. And I think if nothing else, no matter whether or not you like or dislike this movie, there's no refuting that his performance is stellar. Right. All right. Well, uh, let's move on to our home media moment. And this week, that is Life of a King. And Justin's going to tell us about that. During his time in prison, Eugene Brown, played by Cuba Gooding Jr., spent his time learning the game of chess from a fellow inmate, played by Dennis Haysbert. Upon his release, he gets a job as a janitor, but when he has to take over detention, he teaches the troubled to use the game of chess, and to always think before making a move. Perhaps the best thing Life of a King has going for it is its lead actor, Cuba Gooding Jr., who continues to prove that he may very well be the most underappreciated actor of the past 10 years. Like most films based on true stories, Life of a King has a fair share of predictable cliches, but Cuba Gooding Jr.'s enthusiastic performance almost allows one to look past them for the majority of the film. The overall message of thinking about choices before making one ranks true throughout the duration without getting too preachy, even when there's a couple moments where that may not necessarily feel necessary. Life of a King may, may not be far off from melodramatic TV movie material, but it does have an interesting, albeit predictable, story but a pretty good performance from Cuba Gooding Jr., and I'll give it a B-. minus. Joe, what do you think of Life of a King? It's so refreshing to see Cuba Gooding Jr. in a starring role again. Among my favorite actors, Cuba has made his name by playing memorable side characters, but is very capable of carrying his own movie. Admittedly, Life of a King is a story that seems to have been done time and again. A quirky or damaged individual goes into an inner city school and finds a means of helping to guide youths down a better path. In this case, Eugene Brown uses chess as a metaphor for life decisions and even helps one young man in particular escape the darker path that some of his friends have taken. One thing I wished King would have done was focus on the emotional turmoil of the estranged relationship that Eugene Brown had with his children. I felt that these scenes seemed to be some of the most compelling of the film. Though they were not the main story, I felt that the two plots could have been more balanced. Still, the performances were good and the narrative based around true events. It's a heartwarming tale that should leave the audience with a smile, as it did me. And I give it a B. This is actually the second movie about inner-city children playing chess that I've seen in the past year. The first being a documentary called Brooklyn Castle. Both true stories, but different approaches. One in New York, the other in D.C. In Castle, we start in the middle of the story, where the kids have already won championships and the students are already into chess. Whereas King starts from the very beginning of the journey, and we see how the kids get interested in the game, and I think it adds to the drama. I am a sucker, I admit it, for the teacher inspires the uninterested, underprivileged student story. But you know, it's been done. It's been done to death. But King does add a couple of great twists, like that Eugene isn't even a teacher, but a janitor assigned to cover the detention room, like Justin mentioned. It's different. And that Eugene has a checkered past of his own and did a lot of jail time so that he can relate much better to the kids he's trying to help also, I think, gives this movie a leg up on some of those other films. 
Gooding gives a great performance in King, and though there are a fair amount of cliches here, like the father-son issues, I actually did like the father-daughter story. Mm-hmm. Father-son, just maybe because, like you say, it wasn't very developed it at was all. Barely there. Really. He was in yeah. maybe three scenes and very incidentally. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did like the, the father-daughter story. Um, you know, the one kid that isn't able to be saved, he's in there too. It also avoids some other traps, though, because of its heartfelt writing and strong characters. I only gave Brooklyn Castle a B. King actually gets an A- minus from me. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. I really enjoyed it. Hmm. I'm, uh, I'm glad I threw that your way, then. Yeah, well, look, I'll watch anything with Cuba. I mean... <laughs> Even Snow Dogs. Well, Boat I trip. haven't seen it, but I wouldn't mind seeing Snow Dogs, probably. What about Boat Trip? Boat Trip... It kind of killed his career for well, a while. Well, yeah, and Daddy Day Camp didn't really oh. do much to bring it back. Yeah, yes. I almost forgot about that. Thank you. What was uh, that about him being underappreciated, Justin? Well, maybe maybe it was deserved for a little while. Well, I think oh, he geez. just he just picked some bad movies for a while there yeah. and then kind of disappeared. He's sort of in that like path of people where... Like, Halle Berry is one of these, too. Mm. The moment they win an Oscar, the next like four movies they do are all just like stinkers. I don't know, like maybe she did Catwoman right after she won the Oscar for Monsters <laughs> Ball. Monsters Ball. And it's like, it's actually really? <laughs> right around the same time, too. Out of curiosity before watching this movie, because I haven't seen that many movies with a minute in a mm-hmm. while, like, it was pretty much the 90s. He had, like, all these well-received roles, these big movies. Yeah. He was like a king. Radio, you know, Jerry Maguire, then, of course. Right around, then Snow Dogs is the last big one listed, and then The Butler, 2013. I'm like, yeah. So there's like a... a de- Everything in between a, is like... a decade okay. gap, literally a decade <laughs> gap of just... Like nothing significant. Yeah, just that's interesting. It's, it's yeah, it's kind of a shame because I I agree. I think he, when given the right role, is really good at. It. I mean, I totally believed him in this. Yeah, I thought the janitor thing was a good twist. Obviously, it's based on true stories, so that's how it really happened. But yeah. you know, pretty much all of these movies, you know, Freedom Riders and. Dangerous Minds and Half Nelson. Michelle Pfeiffer, and, yeah. yeah. Coach um, Carter. Coach Carter. It's <laughs> always like the, the teacher. And here, you know, he's the janitor. Mm-hmm. They find out about his past and he gets fired pretty early on in the movie, really. Mm-hmm. And he still decides to sort of set up this, this chess club at his house. And I, I, I don't know. It, I really liked it. It's kind of like Renaissance Man if he was a janitor and they weren't in the army. I, you know I haven't seen Renaissance Man, I'm, I'm, so I'll just, have to take your word for it. Just tell me, it's, it's, it's still kind of a similar formula. <laughs> All right, well, moving on, we're going to do a top ten this week, um, and this is in honor of Jason Bateman's directorial debut in Bad Words, and it's also interesting to note that our old classic uh, listener's choice in Bruges is also a directorial debut, Martin McDonough. Um, so we're going to do our top ten 21st century debuts in directing so 2000 and upwards and joe let's start with you 10 through 2 all right this was an interesting list and actually a lot harder to put together than i thought it really was i had about like 18 or 19 that i really wanted to put on i found about like 15 or 20 movies yeah "Hmm, they're they're all ones that i really like all right number 10 i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing this correctly but tarsum singh the cell uh amazing visuals compelling ideas and a decent j-lo performance can Mm -hmm. you believe it (laughs) i can't well, uh, there it is. Uh, one of the few. Well, made in Manhattan, I guess, you know. Classic. Classic Ray Fine. <laughs> Classic Ray Fine. <laughs> in a romantic comedy. I thought it was okay. Uh, number nine, Francis Lawrence, Constantine. Honestly, one of the few comic book adaptions I think is better than the source material. Mm. And believe it or not, once again, Keanu Reeves and Shia LaBeouf together, both giving good performances, and I like them. Must be a great director. <laughs> wow. You're about the first person I'll say. that has actually given credit to that movie. Hey, it's a good movie. It's underrated and one of Keanu Reeves' best performances. I mean, screw The Matrix. He he dominated that movie. Mm. Number eight, Joss Whedon, Serenity. I talked about this a bit recently. Not perfect, but it does wrap up a lot of loose ends. You shouldn't think it should be able to, and it's still really entertaining. Good cap off to Firefly. Number seven, J.J. Abrams, Mission Impossible 3. Uh, Once again, my favorite Mission Impossible movie, greatest villain ever, and it had really intense stakes, kept me really invested the whole way through. Loved it. Number six, Judd Apatow, 40-Year-Old Virgin. Honestly, one of Steve Carell's best performances. It's just so funny, so quotable. I've always loved this one. It just I never get tired of watching it. Number five, Frank Miller, Sin City. Admittedly, he co-directed this with Robert Rodriguez, so I don't know how much credit he really deserves, but still, it has much of his influence over his own stories, and he does a really good job helping to translate them to screen very well. 
Number four, Gareth Edwards, Monsters. Uh, really great character study against the giant monster backdrop, which is really unique, and it also gives me hope for the new Godzilla film that he is going to be in charge of. So I think this guy is very talented, and hopefully he'll provide. Duncan Jones, Moon. Compelling story with a minimalist budget and an amazing atmosphere, and another great Sam Rockwell performance. And my number two is Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead. It's probably his most solid film. It's very funny, and once again, never get tired of seeing it. Love it. Uh, there's a bunch on your list I've never seen. Really? Yeah. Uh, Monsters, Constantine, The Cell. Ten City. Sin City, which I, you know... I have to watch As soon. we all know, I'm going to watch it, yeah, this year before uh, Dame to Kill 4 comes out. But. Yeah, there's some good movies on there. I will, I will admit, uh, actually, that The Cell is at the bottom of the list because I do think it's a much weaker movie than the other ones. Mm-hmm. But I still think it does the whole dream sequence thing better than most movies I've ever seen. So I have to give it credit for that. Mm. It's, just, it's just really well done in that sense. Okay. We only share two movies so far. Really? Which yeah, which shows you how expansive this this list is of the of the directors. Um, Justin, I want to hear from you before I go. I want to see how many we have in common now. Uh, if I had to take a wild guess, not many. Um, but oh, probably safe. <laughs> number ten, probably going to be the one that's going to be my most controversial one. James Wan saw the fact that this man basically got an entire horror following in terms of subgenre going for several years is pretty impressive, and there's not many if at all movies or directors that can honestly say that and the fact that he did this on such a small budget it just really allowed people to see one as a force to be reckoned with well hey uh i, I would say it was on the short list yeah i don't have a problem with that and also uh, i've never seen it but i mean i know people that love those and, Saw and movies. don't don't forget guys i mean it should be on the list classic danny glover once again yes oh, yes shows up yet again <laughs> <laughs> getting to my number nine which was on Joe's list, and that is Frank Miller, Sin City. It's rare to see a writer adapt their own work to the screen, let alone direct it, but Frank Miller had that opportunity, and I have to admit, he did a really good job. The pairing with zany action director Robert Rodriguez worked very well, including guest director for about five minutes, Quentin Tarantino. And unfortunately, the spirit was a bit of a disappointment, but I... (laughs) for lack of a better word, but here's hoping Sin City, a dame to kill for, can get him back on track. Number eight is Shane Black, Kiss Kiss Bang Bang. He's an absolutely clever writer with a style all his own, and honestly, I'm surprised it took him this long to get a directing gig. He put together a very witty script, and he honestly got us all starting to believe in Robert Downey Jr. again from anyone who actually saw it. And admittedly, Iron Man 3 was not his best follow-up, but if his writer credits are of any indicator, he'll definitely make up for it in due time. My number seven is Zack Snyder, Dawn of the Dead. The man may be known for his slow-mo, but well before that ever covered any ground, this was one of the best remakes ever done. Wow. He made the source material his own, and he did so with respect to the other one, so that the two can honestly be can be watched on their own terms. And while his later work has been mostly hit or miss, Dawn of the Dead really proved that Despite all the tropes that Snyder's known for, he can make a very good movie if he has a good script to boot. Number six, Zach Braff, Garden State. I thought he just told a very well-developed, very human story. It's funny, poignant, and emotional at times. And I'm hoping his, uh, his upcoming film is going to continue that with all the effort through Kickstarter. My number five is Ryan Johnson, Brick. Neo Noir is a genre all its own, and... In the case of this film, he makes it all the more original by setting it in high school. Strangely enough, it works, and it really showed off the talent of leading man Joseph Gordon-Levitt, who I didn't really think a whole lot of before I saw this movie. The only real reason Ryan Johnson is so low on this list is because, I have to admit, I've only seen this and Looper. So, possibly if I'd seen a couple other ones, he might have gotten higher, but, but just from those two films, he's become easily one of my favorite directors in the business. My number four is Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead. This is a great start to not only the Blood and Ice Cream trilogy, but to his career in general. He introduced the one of my favorite duos of all time, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. I hope they never split apart. And I just think his unique and quirky editing style, while a little bit frenetic at times, is really something special. My number three is Jason Reitman. Thank you for smoking. I think this is independent comedy at its absolute best. It gave me an appreciation for the ever-charismatic actor Aaron Eckhart, and his follow-up films, with the exclusion of Labor Day, have 
honestly continue to show off his talent. My number two is one that I honestly, if I'd put this list together in 2005, would have never happened. Ben Affleck, Gone Baby Gone. While I was never impressed with Affleck as an actor, with the exclusion of Good Will Hunting and Argo, I feel like his efforts as a director is truly something special. Gone Baby Gone is such a sharp, well-told mystery that just continued to leave an impression well afterwards, and I think his, uh, his follow-ups speak for themselves. The Town, while I wasn't a big fan, was a huge hit, and Argo obviously won Best Picture. I love The Town. <laughs> I'm, surpri- I'm surprised you don't like that, but yeah, I, I thought that was that was the one that made me take notice. I like Gone Baby Gone, but I admit, yeah, when I, I saw the town, I was like, all right, I'm in. I like it too. I kind of had mixed feelings about it though. Okay, yeah, there's definitely a few on there. I knew, I knew you'd call out uh, Frank Miller, Edgar Wright, of course, some of your favorites. I think there'll probably be about as many surprises on my list. <laughs> wow. There might be a few though. Uh, my honorable mention actually is Jason Reitman. Labor Day aside, he's one of my favorite directors of the last 10 years. Uh, other than that, all of his movies you know, are A caliber, um, Juno, Young Adult. Thank you for smoking. I don't think shown because of its directing chops. I thought it was just a great movie. So I sort of left him off the list for that, but I, I did want to uh, call attention. Number 10, Sarah Polly, Away From Her. Uh, I don't think either of you have seen this movie. No, but I really want to. It's really, really good. It's about this um, woman who suffers from uh, dementia and her husband having to deal with that and putting her in, in a home and being, as the title says, away from her. And she just really, really wrings emotion uh, from these characters. Number nine, Drew Goddard, The Cabin in the Woods. Ooh. Good choice. Thank you. Um, I thought this... Could have easily been, you know, just another horror movie. Um, and not only is it far from that, but it fuses the comedy very well. And certainly the directing choices in the last, say, 20 minutes or so, when they sort of reveal everything that's going on, could have been done in so many different ways. And I think Goddard really chose a, a strong choice for, uh, for how to present that. Uh, number eight, Stephen Chbotsky for The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Hmm. Um, now, this wasn't on Wikipedia's list of the directorial debuts, but to my knowledge, all he ever did was wrote. He wrote books, he wrote The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and he also wrote the movie version of Rent. But as far as I know, this is his first time at directing. Justin, do you know any differently? Not a... Okay. One of my favorite books... One of my favorite movies the year it came out, I gave it an A+. You know, it's it's awesome when a writer can direct their own stuff, like Justin mentioned with Frank Miller, because they have the greatest vision of how they want it to look. And I thought Chbosky did a fantastic job with Perks. My number seven, much like Joe's number seven, is J.J. Abrams for Mission Impossible 3. Obviously, Abrams had a fair amount of television experience, Although not as much directing as I thought. I thought he had directed like a bunch of aliases, a bunch of loss, only a couple. Yeah, he's mainly the writer and creator, um, which of course I knew that. But yeah, his first foray into feature films was a good one. We've talked at length about the show about Mission Impossible 3. Seems like it. Uh, specifically when Philip Seymour Hoffman passed away. But yeah, just uh, a really, really great action movie and directed very well. Number six, Evan Goldberg and Seth Rogen for This Is The End. <laughs> Comedy is, I think, probably easier to direct than drama, than action, just because it's mainly to be funny, and the actors and the writers, I think, have a bigger hand in doing that than the directors. But what Goldberg and Rogan did for This Is The End was, I mean, obviously they wrote it as well, but took, you know, sort of some, some basics. I mean, most of the movie takes place in James Franco's house. And they really put you in the uh the catastrophe and um their outside shots of the apocalypse happening i thought were really really well done as well number five james bobin for the 2011 muppets uh this was his first full-length feature he had done some stuff with uh the ali g show and sasha baron cohen before but reading the jim henson book i've talked about this on the show before really gives me a great respect for people that actually put these Muppets movies together and work on Sesame Street and Fraggle Rock and all this stuff um, because it's not easy to 
not only direct the actors and the puppeteers themselves, but to place everybody so you can never see the puppeteers and what they're doing. And, and I just thought it was, you know, between the choreography and all of that stuff, I thought that was a good, uh, good attempt. Number four is Judd Apatow for The 40-Year-Old Virgin. What he brings to the table better than I think anybody is allowing his actors to really improvise. And with 40-Year-Old Virgin, you had not only Steve Carell, but Jane Lynch and Seth Rogen (laughs) and all of these people who are very adept at improvising. And he just let the cameras roll and sort of let the actors, you know, speak what they thought was best and sort of picked the best of each of the line readings and stuff like that and i think it's not easy probably for a director to just sort of let that go and let the the actors do what they do best and uh, apatow always has done that number three is stephen daldry for billy elliott um this movie is one of my favorites i i'm saddened that it took me so long to see it i just watched it about a year and a half ago for the first time and it instantly you know became uh, a favorite again just like sarah polly with the emotion he brings a lot of emotion from these you know fairly not simple characters but characters that in somebody else's hands could have been very generic and the settings of the town and everything you know their poor nature and their destitute nature is very well shown off by Daldry's uh, direction. Number two is Bob Peterson for Up. Now, much like one on Joe's list, this was a co-direct. He directed with Pete Docter, who also had a great directorial debut in the 2000s, and that is Monsters, Inc. But Up is my all-time favorite animated film. Uh, The shots that he chose for... The opening montage uh, are among some of the most emotional you'll ever see in uh, animated film or otherwise. You don't often think of animated films as needing to even be directed because it's just sort of like, well, the, the guy draws them and then, you know, they're on the screen. But with something like Up and really all the Pixar movies, I think direction is a major, major factor of how the movie plays. Good choice. Thanks. Yeah, very good. Joe, you're number one. My number one is actually a double. Jonathan Dayton and Valerie Ferris, Little Miss Sunshine. It's a fantastic comedy, and once again, another great performance from everybody involved, and obviously that speaks to great direction. Honestly, probably my favorite Steve Carell performance to date. Hmm. I really, really liked him in this movie. thought the characters were very well written. A lot of timeless themes. It was very simple, but just very clever, very enjoyable, great narrative. And, I mean, it's in my top 25, so how could it not be number one absolutely that is a great choice good movie all the way through i mean it's so enjoyable everyone does a great job alan arkin best paul dano obviously abigail breslin greg kinnear greg yeah greg kinnear one of my favorites as we know and tony collette and tony I mean, collette just, like, just a great cast i mean it really is one of the best uh, comedy casts in a while mm-hmm. justin duncan jones moon just told a great sci-fi story on a small budget, made really good use of, of the leads who, ironically, are the same man, Sam Rockwell, great person. <laughs> <laughs> but just one of the few 21st century films to end on a cliffhanger that not only left me satisfied, but really excited to see where it's going next. I gotta rewatch this movie. I was gonna say, I, Moon. I don't understand why you don't I, like I must it. have been in a bad mood or something when I saw it. I've said been. that several times. Because every time we talk about it, I'm like, I don't know. Maybe I What'd just... What'd you give it, like a C or something? Oh, no. Like a D plus or something. I really didn't like it. Yeah. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. probably should watch that sometime. See if you can sure. get that grade up a little I'm, bit. I'm, I'm totally up for that. Because apparently I missed the boat. The moon boat. <laughs> <laughs> the boat. The boat to the space boat <laughs> the to the moon. moon. Yeah, that's right. All right. Well, my number one is Mark Webb. 500 Days of Summer. Oh. This is one of my all-time favorite Joseph Gordon-Levitt movies. It's the one that really got me hooked onto him, and he had that streak. We've talked about this on the show before, where he had a movie in my top ten of the year for, like, four consecutive years. 500 Days of Summer kicked it off. Mark Webb just took this great script to begin with and just added so many cool flourishes to it, putting the, the day number between each scene and one of the few times you can say that a out of place bizarre musical dance number 
didn't feel out of place. It's kind of music video it's, of the movie. It's perfect. And it's everything that I think they wanted Spider-Man 3's dance number to be. Now I know why they picked him for the Amazing spider I know, and it's so ironic <laughs> that Mark Webb now is directing the uh, the new Amazing Spider-Man series. But um, yeah, I just I love 500 Days of Summer. Great performances. Um, really, really good directing. And romance, I think, is another genre that you don't really think of like, okay, that needs to be directed by a pro. But maybe that's why 500 Days of Summer is such a good romance movie. They might need to take romances more seriously because of that. Because I think that might be a misconception. I mean, if you're trying to get to demonstrate two people that seem like they're really in love, you might really need that push. Yeah. We'd get a whole lot less stock movies, if that mm. were the case. Well, that's, yeah, that's absolutely true. And <laughs> there certainly wouldn't be anything wrong with that. Mm, not but, at uh, all. Yeah, good lists all around, guys. Yeah. yeah. I really uh, enjoyed that one. You'll be happy to know Mark Webb was on the short list. Was he? Yes. Yeah, I love that movie. Oh. All right, well, uh, moving on in our show, we have the triple feature, and that is three older movies. The first is our new classic, which this week is 21 Jump Street. Our old classic is our first official listener's choice, and uh, that is from Marcus, and that's In Bruges. And finally, we have our Oscar nominee, Alice's Restaurant. Finally, the last of the Alice movies. We've got four of them now. <laughs> Finally, uh, I have that rut. <laughs> yeah, so this will be the last one. So we start with 21 Jump Street, and Joe's going to tell us about that. All right. 21 Jump Street, a 2012 action comedy written by Michael Bacall and directed by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. It stars Jonah Hill as Morton Schmidt and Channing Tatum as Greg Jenko. Back in high school, Morton was a nerdy kid who was often picked on by Greg, who was somewhat of a dim-witted jock. Both of them graduate unhappy due to their own inherent weaknesses. Seven years later, however, the two of them become friends when they enter the police academy and coach each other. They are still somewhat incompetent, though, as police officers, and are therefore sent to the Jump Street Division, where they are sent back to high school to go undercover and stuff out a drug ring. The two's friendship is tested as they relive high school again and learn a little more about each other along the way. This movie is probably a fresh reboot of the original show, I never saw it, and Tatum and Hill make a great comedy duo, playing off each other excellently. The gags are often crude, but there are many laughs to be had here for many audiences, as well as some decent action and a really good story about genuine character growth. This movie is very enjoyable and can be easily viewed by just about any moviegoer, and I give it an A-. Nice. This film was on uh, Justin and my top five shows turned into movies a couple of weeks ago. And uh, like Joe mentioned, he had never seen the original show. I'm the, the one of the three of us that used to watch the show in the 80s, which proves it's completely hilarious whether you've seen the show or not. It's certainly its own thing, but there are plenty of winks and nods to the original series as well. Everybody knows Johnny Depp got his start on Jump Street and makes his cameo here, but for those loyalists, there's even more cameos in the big screen version to enjoy. I mean, Joe pretty much said it. The chemistry between Hill and Tatum is phenomenal. Uh, Tatum shows some true comedic chops that I don't think many people realized he had until this film. Uh, the supporting cast is great as well, most notably Rob Riggle as the gym coach. And even Ice Cube as the boss at Jump Street shows more comedic talent in just a few scenes than he did in all of Ride Along from earlier this year. Mm. Easily. Uh, 22 Jump Street is on my top five most anticipated for 2014. Cannot wait for that to come out in a couple months and see how it stacks up to the original. For me, 21 is an absolute A. Justin? Taking a cult TV favorite in a different direction is a risky move that usually isn't executed well. Dark Shadows. As we've seen in... As Dark Shadows and Hutch. <laughs> actually, both. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, though, I actually liked the Dukes of Hazard movie. Really? I, I liked it. I avoided that at all costs. To be fair, right. to be I'm fair, ashamed though, to say I've seen it. I was like probably about 14 or 15 at oh, the time. Oh, that's the age for it. And I had never seen the show. Oh. Okay. So that might be one reason. <laughs> Could be. but Could be. But in the case of 21 Jump Street, this works in its favor with amazing results. While the film definitely takes a fair bit of friendly jabs at the stereotypical nature of the source material, it also pays homage to it within the narrative and a couple of alumni from the original show popping up here and there. As mentioned recently, Hill and Tatum have great chemistry together and play off each other beautifully to give the film some of its funniest moments. While the film's in-your-face style tends to get a bit much at times, particularly during the tripping scenes... No, I like the tripping scenes. I love the tripping scenes! <laughs> Continue. The overall end product is a pleasant surprise from the usual television shows making the transition to film that, as we just mentioned, usually end up in disaster, and I give it a B+. Yeah, I've, I've always wondered about that, Justin, your, your B-plus for this movie, because you certainly, like, laughed all throughout it. 
line for line, I think it's probably a funnier movie than even like Bridesmaids, which I gave an A plus to. It's a hilarious movie. So what what exactly were you hoping to see that you didn't see, or like I said, I thought it was a little too in in your face. The humor I liked. The action sequences are a bit episodic, and I think the love interest side plot with Jonah Hill was it could have used a bit more development. I think I could agree with that. Necessary to the story, though. Well, to there's, there's a, growth. in in terms of the uh, contrast from past to present role reversal. I just think for what happens between like the dynamic between the two of them in the last part of the movie when they are like on that um, the action fueled chase. You know, he's, like, texting her the whole time. I mean, role reversal, I guess, is part of it, but I think it adds to the whole nature of the story because it it sort of, I don't know, maybe it is what Joe said, the character development, because he's sort of torn between, like, yeah, I want to be a cop, Mm. but for the first time in my life, the girl likes me, too. It's like I get to do high school over again, but I'm actually the cool kid. Right. So I can understand that. I thought that's what the movie was about, kind of dealing with your childhood traumas Mm -hmm. and adolescence. So I think that part's definitely necessary for the overall story. You just don't like the way it was done. I think they could have gone a little bit further with it. It's just... It's it's not easy to do an action comedy well. No, 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 not at all. I mean... I've seen it done well. There's yeah, there's a few you could mention. Beverly Hills Cop is one. 48 Hours. Never saw it, but yes, that is one of your favorites. Hot Fuzz that we can say we saw. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, Hot Fuzz. Yeah, Hot Fuzz, though, there's even more to it than that. Hot yeah, Fuzz is like half a little action, bit of a probably. mystery. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in Hot Fuzz. That's like, true. Yeah, certainly for the, the TV show send-ups, it's, it was, I think, risky, like Justin mentioned, to take this dramatic show, which granted is... Jesus. way dated yeah i mean it's super cheesy now um but at the time it was like this hard-hitting you know oh you know edgy show i heard um, <laughs> what, from what i've heard is that the beginning is actually really dramatic but it kind of wears thin pretty quickly like by like the five in the, in the five subsequent episodes. seasons oh, okay something like that like maybe season one was really good and then I it guess. started getting cheesier I'm yeah not- that's probably true i mean i have to imagine fox was such a new network it was one of the first shows they put on mm-hmm. and they were really trying to pull out all the guns. So I imagine... Literally. literally <laughs> so I imagine they probably got pressure from Fox execs to be like, all right, listen, you know, next week you got to really, like, do it four times as crazy. And, like, you know... <laughs> so it's kind of like because, the A-team? Uh, it, it goes like... It, like, leapfrogs the A-team. Really? In, like, terms of Insanity. ridiculousness. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Although people get hurt on Jump Street. <laughs> Nobody ever gets hurt on No, A-team. there's explosions and bullets, <laughs> but everybody's fine. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, <laughs> go off on a little tangent, A-Team movie was, like, not that good. I, I was a big A-Team fan. Not I a big had, A-Team fan, but I watched it when I was a kid. I was trying to be a little too gritty. I thought, that's what I thought. You know, I, I thought they were trying too hard. I know people that liked it, but maybe that's one of those diehard fans that just like to see the A-Team movie? Could be. I don't know. I, th- I, I thought they went a really good direction with Jump Street. Absolutely. And I, obviously it worked. I'm yeah. interested in seeing the show. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm curious to you see You don't ever need to. I, did, I, I, just, <laughs> I have no real interest, I have all five but, seasons if you want to borrow them, but you're not going to want to borrow them. <laughs> just see the next Jump Street it's, movie? Yeah, just see 22, which okay. uh, comes out soon. <laughs> All right, moving on is In Bruges, our listener's choice from Marcus. We uh, thank you for that, Marcus. Thanks for all your uh, support of the show. And Justin's going to tell us about that. Glad we got to review this one. Yeah. After an assignment has gone horribly wrong, resulting in the death of a child, Irish hitman Ray, played by Colin Farrell, and his partner Ken, played by Brendan Gleeson, are sent off to Bruges by their boss Harry, played by Ray Fiennes, to wait further instructions. Though as the real details as to why they are there come to light, Things continue to go awry as the two begin to face the consequences of their actions. In Bruges is a unique spin on an all-too-familiar genre. Stories about assassins with a comedic edge are often overdone in cinema today, but rare is the time that they're ever paired with equal parts dark drama and a couple hints of magical realism near the end. The result is strange, particularly during transitions between the two, but it ends up being so funny, intense, and original that it's hard not to get drawn into the narrative. Farrell easily plays the most complicated character of his career, 
both playfully silly and haunted at the exact same time. And as the film goes on, the better this gets put to use. Granted, the film doesn't always work, and the third act, while fitting the foreshadowing, will likely divide audiences, but it is still one of the most strangely clever films out there in a long time, and I give it a B+. Alright. Yeah, this was a pleasant surprise in 2008 when it was released. Justin, you and I had seen this before. Mm-hmm. Joe was uh, was new to it. In Bruges, at the time, it was kind of like her from last year. It only got talked about with any regularity in certain circles, but those people were very passionate about how great and original that it was. Award Voters was one of those circles, and the film was nominated for Best Screenplay at the Oscars and the picture itself, plus both stars, Gleason and Farrell, were nominated at the Golden Globes, with Farrell winning a Best Actor in a Comedy Statue, among many other award shows around the world. It is a truly original film, featuring great performances, and Bruges is a wonderful backdrop for the story, too. Some iconic lines are littered through this film, which Joe pointed out as he was watching it, um, which maybe he'll talk about. But I do sort of wish the action was as fun or as energetic as the pacing and wit of the dialogue. And like Justin said, it does sort of fall apart a little bit at the end. But I'm definitely glad I got to see it a second time. Bruges is a fun, dark comedy, and I give it a B plus as well. Joe? I now know the movie where several very funny quotes come from. I'd seen several of these scenes online, but I never knew what the film was. I was always like, I've got to see this movie because these scenes are just hilarious. Or they're just great, great And you dialogue. kept saying that. Like, every time one would pop up, you'd be like, oh, this is where that's from. Because like, I, just, I just see these random scenes, like top ten, or like, I don't know, top thousand best insults or memorable movie quotes. And mm-hmm. I'd see these scenes, I'm like, what movie is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but now I know. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the film's claim to fame is really the excellent performances, which complement some really good dialogue. Colin Farrell gives a great performance here, as you guys mentioned, but Brennan Gleeson and Ray Fiennes are very memorable as well. The movie deals with some rather heavy matters, but still manages to be surprisingly cheerful for most of the run. There is just something so charming about career criminals making remarks about rather silly day-to-day observations. I never get tired of those sort of scenarios. Mm -hmm. I love that stuff. The story did have some odd transitions, as you guys also mentioned, in terms of editing, but it does encourage the audience to pay attention. It's a very smart comedy, which toes a very dark line, and I give it an A-. Mm, wow. Bravo. Yeah, great uh, first pick for our official uh, listener's choice. Yeah, yeah, nice job, Marcus. Well, yeah, well done, Marcus. That's really and, good. Uh, keep them coming. We are going to do the listener's choice segment uh, at least once a month. We have our own rotation for the first three weeks of the month, and then the fourth, or if there's a fifth week of the month, will be up to you guys, the listeners. So let us know on our YouTube page, or uh, you can let us know on the Facebook group as well, Film Fanatics with an exclamation point. And we already have a couple in the ring for next month, so yeah. All right, well, finally, we've got Alice's Restaurant, which was nominated at the 1969 Oscars for Arthur Penn's Directing. Alice's Restaurant is one of the truly rare times when a film was based on a song. In this case, Arlo Guthrie's mostly spoken word 18-minute track, Alice's Restaurant Massacre, from two years earlier. The song is a mostly true story of how Guthrie was arrested on Thanksgiving for illegally dumping garbage from his friend Alice's establishment and then got called in for the draft. Him being a hippie and also anti-war, of course, try tried anything he could do to get out of serving. The film follows this main structure also while adding in other fictitious events and people. Guthrie plays himself, and oddly enough, so does his arresting officer, a non-actor named William Obenheim. (laughs) Alice's Restaurant is a completely dated but fun ride, and Guthrie actually has an extraordinary amount of charm for someone who had never acted before. Its datedness is actually endearing in a way, because not only does it turn out to be a time capsule of the late 60s, but also very much of hippie culture at the time, and how it was viewed as threatening to law enforcement and others. It sort of meanders a bit towards the middle and end, but it's a surprisingly good film, especially since it was the first foray into comedy from director Penn, who was known for dramatic or action fare like The Miracle Worker and Bonnie and Clyde. I give Alice's Restaurant a B. Justin? Alice's Restaurant is one of those films with a surprising amount of potential, given the source material, but... Whether or not it hits the mark is questionable. While the film does focus on the narrative of the Eat song, the film puts Guthrie himself in the major spotlight of the protagonist amidst hippie-esque culture. 
It's a raw look, and while the first act seems largely like a vehicle to possibly serve as a means for Guthrie as an actor, it is rather compelling. The problem comes around the second act, about midway that is, in which Guthrie's character seems to be thrown to the wayside to focus on Alice herself, which makes for an interesting storyline, but ultimately feels like the audience is watching two entirely different movies. It's hard to say which was better, albeit the strange, depressing ending doesn't really help, but Alice's Restaurant still has more going for it than it probably should, so I'll give credit where credit's due and give it a B-. minus. Not bad. Joe, how did it grab you? This film was very much a product of its time and it shows. Essentially trying to capture the counterculture movement of the hippie lifestyle, it does remain entertaining and pushes many boundaries for the time. Drug use, nudity, sex, and anti-establishment themes are very prevalent here. Gunthry as himself is a very likable character with some great lines, and he steals just about every scene that he's in. The cinematography is almost documentary style, which is somewhat unconventional for the time. Still, the movie basically is a conduit for Gunthry himself, as Justin pointed out, and sadly this film loses some momentum all about midway through. While it is partially following the main character's adventures and following his perspective of his generation, he more or less disappears from the film midway through, and we are meant to follow Alice's wedding from there on in. However, this is so unevenly edited and written that by the time the film ends we feel like we have only watched half of another movie with some underdeveloped characters. It's still an interesting story, but it feels like there was a loss of direction somewhere. Plus some really odd sex scenes. Yeah. It's well worth a watch. It has some consistently entertaining vibes, but with a few problems. I ultimately will give it a B-. minus. Yeah, it was, it was interesting to see. I mean, it was... I think we all sort of hit upon this, you know, that, yeah, it sort of falls apart a little bit in the middle and the end, but it's really an interesting look into this world. I mean, you get the Mm -hmm. sense that everybody involved in this was probably a hippie Mm -hmm. from, obviously, you know, all the actors and stuff to the directing and the producers, and I think everybody was was kind of, you know, putting together a movie for for them. You know, it, it felt very honest. By them, I don't mean, like, them specifically, but, like, the whole hippie movement. I imagine they probably didn't see a lot of people that reflected themselves on screen in 1969. Mm-hmm. It just seemed very real to me. Like, mm-hmm. it wasn't like the this glorified Hollywoodized movie, big budget. It was just very down-to-earth. It was real people. Right. And it really felt very different from a lot of films at that time. Like, most films from the 60s, it's still there's still kind of that distancing. It still seems very glamorized. Yeah. This movie felt very ahead of its time because of how gritty and real it was to me. I completely agree. Definitely. Yeah, there's movies that try to sort of take on like the Woodstocky vibe now. What was the was it called Taking Woodstock? There was a Woodstock mm-hmm. movie, yeah. And Which was just not good. Man. And I don't you know, for many reasons. But part of it was it just didn't feel like the sixties. Yeah, well it sort of felt like more like they were maybe poking fun at it a little bit. A little bit. As opposed to like presenting it, you know, how it might have been. This movie premiered uh just few days after arlo guthrie played at woodstock so i mean mm-hmm. it really hit the right time you Absolutely. know i think mm-hmm. so i mean I, I think it was interesting that it was nominated for something it's not the type of movie you usually see yeah i'm surprised the academy would have even given that one uh, an acknowledgement especially around the time maybe somebody felt that it was worth it for hippie culture because it's such a big part not yeah to, possibly not to mention the director already had a couple credits to his name so well that's certainly true yeah he had, he had directed five or six you know pretty highly acclaimed movies the chase being one of them that i uh, i didn't mention also I remember that you um, actually made the comment you were surprised you thought the directing was one of the weaker aspects. I did. Movie. That's And, you know, like I said, I, I didn't realize at the time that this guy was mostly known for other types of movies. Um, so that sort of put it into perspective a little bit for me. Mm-hmm. But just sort of thinking about how everybody was kind of trying to put together something that their kind, let's say, could enjoy. And uh, I don't know whether this Arthur Penn, you know sort of was a hippie with them or was just sort of along for the ride and trying wanted to try something new the the director was a little scattershot but i think for his first attempt at comedy it's not too bad i mean guthrie certainly uh, i think steals (laughs) the show it's it's a shame he does sort of disappear for a little bit for about 20 minutes there in the middle you don't really see him at all yeah as we focus on alice's story and like justin mentioned i was fine with alice's story also it's sort of a question of you know, I mean, they were both kind of interesting, yeah. but they weren't. But they weren't really synonymous with each other. No, no. it's like <laughs> you know, it's like you guys said. I mean, it's two separate movies just kind of smashed together. Right, right. 
All right. Well, uh, an- another fairly positive Oscar movie, though. Yeah, it was, yeah, I liked it. It was still pretty good. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, despite the B minus, I I definitely don't regret watching it. Yeah. No, me, I, me neither. I could watch it again. Mm-hmm. And uh, next week we'll get one of our finest Oscar nominees yet. Not to not to spoil it, but we're doing uh, Aliens, and we're also going to watch Alien as well. And sort of review both of them. And uh, I think probably the first Oscar nominee that we've all seen the movie ahead of time. Yeah, because I think yep. I've only seen maybe two or three in advance. I was the one that never saw about Schmidt. You That's had right. never seen about a boy, Joe. Mm-hmm. Neither of you had seen African Queen, yeah. right? Yeah, maybe. so uh, it'll be interesting. Yeah, but uh, all right. Well, that will do it for the show this week. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, we do have the subscriptions on YouTube. If you are not a subscribed member of the show, but you are a frequent listener, please uh, go ahead and subscribe. You'll get uh, the updates then for whenever we do post a new episode. Uh, we have the Twitter feed, which is at a film fanatics pod. The uh, Facebook group, which I mentioned earlier about listener's choice is film fanatics with an exclamation point. We post our five word reviews there weekly. And also we'll let you know there when we post a new episode of the show and uh, Joe, anything new on your channel? Uh, well, I'm just putting together a top ten arch enemies list that should be coming up pretty soon, and I'm got cool. I've got a lot of a lot of ideas coming out soon. Hopefully, I know that we've got another there goes Tokyo in the works. So, oh, good, yeah, the lead up to uh, Godzilla continues. Yeah, there's there's a lot of things coming. Very cool, and uh, you can uh, just click on the links to that at uh, the bottom of or in the description of this video right here. All right, well, thanks a lot for listening, and we'll see you back here next week. Bye.